Um, I met the Morris, I suppose, probably in 1953. I've been dancing from 1954 around to 73, 74, after which I became a musician to various Morris sites. So I've had 58 years in the the Morris. I ran what I thought was my last instruction in 1997, um, and I thought that was it, but it turned out not to be so. Once the Morris dancer, all the Morris dancer, then you want them. And my business card says rocket scientist and Morris dancer. Um, my professional career, um, I claim to involve the rockets. It stretches from Blue Danube through Blue Street, Polaris, Trident, and pretty well all the UK's nuclear delivery systems, which has presented a certain amount of problem in my career because um, the Morris tends to get involved with, uh, or did, with a campaign for nuclear disarmament. And I can remember being involved in a demonstration at Dudley. I had to have a quiet chat with my security officer about what the hell was I doing complaining about my job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I had to explain I was there because I was actually um, interested in Barney Morris and what they did. I had the slightest interest in what they were protesting about and so on. Um, it has been a problem until I suppose the last 10 or 15 years where uh, nobody seemed to care about it in the same way they used to back in the, the 60s, 70s and so on. Um, having said that, that um, I started in, the, in 1958 I started getting involved in doing research and by 1960 where I had the pleasure of pleasure, <laughs> my project was cancelled and it was two years before we had something uh, fresh to get going with. So I spent two years uh, working at a microfilm reader in my office, transcribing Morris material, um, and going off to talk to almost all the people who um, knew Sharp and teaching from the early generation, and everybody who I was aware of who collected anything and talked to them. So come 1963, I had a good background in what we knew, and thanks to Liz Matthews, I got involved in teaching uh, over the Morris. So I know um, about 48 years of actually been teaching Morris as well. Um, all that means I'm just a bit older than most people. My kidneys failed six years ago. I suffered osteoarthritis. Um, None of these things are to do with Morris Nancy, I have to say. Um, it real won't. But it does mean that I have great difficulty in getting around and doing things and so on. But I did discover last weekend I can actually run a Morris weekend by sitting in a chair. This is something that I thought was impossible. Um, what I intended to talk about, I, first of all, is that yes, I have been acclaimed for quite a bit of the, uh, my. Morris period, um, never an animal because I'm not that sort of person. <laughs> Thank you. Right. At least um, not in public, Roy. Yeah, that's right. Um, but back in the mid 50s, the problem was there were no role, role models worth speaking of. The only two I can think of were Jack Hamilton, who was sort of Tommy for the Bows of London City, and um, he had a, a great character. And of course the unicorn in Westminster, who in those days was a trained mime artist, um, who set the standard which the club has followed ever since and so on, on how to behave with that sort of animal. Um, but there really wasn't anything else. So the side I was in at Farnborough, the Farnborough Morris, 
which consists of a bunch of scientists, I have to say. Um, well, one of them went on to be the director of um, uh, an ordnance factory. Another one was, became director of a research station then in Portland, and so on. They all did very well. Um, I didn't do too badly, by comparison. Um, but they were a very intellectual lot, and they had to face up to the problem of, um, in a sense, of part of the Morris appeared to be the characters, and what were the characters' roles, and so on, and how they evolved it. Um, you could appeal to history up to a point, but of course, um, it History, that by that, I mean the sort of books that you can borrow as secondary sources. Didn't really tell you much about what I would call natural fools or buffoons, the sort of people that read um, harm, as distinct from the sort of um, jester that were in the court or you know, domestic claims, as it were, the late Middle Ages and so on, which again were no guide whatsoever <coughs> because. Somebody who just sat along the side of the king, as it were, and made rude remarks about everybody, sitting and sat there, seemed to help. Um, so one had to look a bit uh, more with it. Looking at the tradition in those days, yes, there was a claim with Brampton. Um, there was an ineffective claim with Hennington. Uh, there were hobby horses at Chipping Camp, Ilmington, <coughs> and so on. Um, and when I started to ask questions about that, the first fascinating thing I found both at Bidford and um, Ilmington that it was the hobby horse who was actually the trainer of the side. Um, it turned out these were in fact the best dancers in the, t in the team um, who knew most of it. And being outside the team could actually see what was going on and knew what advice to give and who wanted to be helped and so on. So, first thing that um, we learned is that the characters are the elite of the Morris. Um, it came as a surprise a lot of other sides at that time where the, the clan and the animal, if there were one, were in fact people who knew least about what they were doing and what they were expected to do, and they were just dressed up and drifted around and so on. The next thing we realised is that we're performing in public in the round. Now the Morris is, uh, in my mind, the difference between the Morris and any other uh, thing is it goes out to meet its audience. There's nothing else that I can think of uh, which gets out on the street and does a free show, free if you're not generous that is, um, a free show for people, uh, and it's in the round. Now what else, where did the experience come in the end? Well, we all know that dancing at fates or carnivals in the display area you know, ended up having to be tidy, organised and remote <coughs> and so on. And we, like many other sides since, have said we're not doing that sort of thing. You know, the Morris is an interaction with the audience and so on, that's why we've gone out in the street in the first place. That's all when we work outside of a pub and that sort of thing. Um, we're not a display in that sense. So again, it was back to, well, what are the characters for? How do you actually interact with the audience? Um, the third final area was the realisation that the only other professional area where you dance is performed in the rain is the circus. And of course circuses had claims, but again, it doesn't the circus claim is not quite the same as the claim for the Morris. For very good reason. Um, circus claims, if you grow up in the circus, when you're about two or three, you start to be trained to tumble. When you're five or six you start to be trained on the bit of apparatus. So the claim in the circus is actually probably able to take everybody's part in the circus, particularly the smaller local ones and so on. He's the supreme professional. 
Now, that, of course, applies to the Morris as well. That, in fact, the claim is usually the most gifted one you've got for the elite and so on. But it brought, really brings me down to, um, or let's say, the next thing. As a claim, the first problem was what sort of claim was I intended to be? You know, um, you can't copy somebody else. It's like looking at um, comedians <coughs> on film, <coughs> listening on radio, and more recently on television. See, I'm old enough now to remember when television didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't I lucky here? Yeah. <coughs> you notice that all the good ones are unique. You know, the two Ronnies and so on, you know, they're, they're just like them. Um, and the struggle with new comedian stories is how do they find it a different character for themselves. And that is true of, of Kang. So although we're meant to be visual um, and no, not terribly audible, anyhow, um, each person has to find their own, own persona as a play. It's not the way you are normally, as it were, but how are you as a clan that matters. Um, all right, I feign my result. I'm not quite six foot, but five eleven and a half. Um, I was typically about twenty stone and rotund all my life. Um, even at the age of eighteen, when playing rugby, um, I was that sort of size and so on. Um, and if people think I've been fat and awkward, I have a running medal. I ran a hundred yards in ten point eight seconds at the age of eighteen. So I could get a move on in those days. Um, so I was big, large, and the right thing was I was, I was good at bouncing people. And that was <laughs> people running into me bounced off. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Um, particularly the smaller they are, the further they would bounce. <laughs> so I, I remember Bob Bradbury, we were doing uh, swaggering bony down at Minehead, and he jumped into the middle of the set. No, I was. And he bounced off right out of the set again. <laughs> back with somersault. It was quite impressive, really. <laughs> it was upset as well. Um, when I went to the front with Morris Summit, like with Kenneth on one occasion, um, it caused confusion amongst the French. What sort of character was it? Until they came up with Uber Tricks. Now, he's the rather large one with blue stripe. Um, trailers and so on. Yes, that's right. And he pushes people around and he lifts the high things up and so on. Yeah, I was like that. Um, so that was my sort of character. Being awkward in the big cutting and so on. Um, what I liked about it though was the opportunity of being spontaneous. It, it always struck me with the Morris in general it in, well, it became evident when working with university sites, particularly working with Bath City. The trouble with young people is when they get a good idea, they want to do it over and over again. Unfortunately, good ideas tend to be a little bit cruel to start with, and every repeat gets a little worse. So one of the messages that we tried to give to the, the youngsters at Bath was that whatever stunt you do, you never repeat it. Yeah. Particularly as they're an intelligent um, part of the community, um, they shouldn't have had problems actually coming up with something fresh as well. Um, but trying to be different, and that encourages people to be spontaneous. Now, it comes back really to why was I involved with the Morris at all? You probably don't realise back in the mid 50s how regimented the Morris world was. Um, you can't blame the Morris ring for that, it was just because they were the only organisation at the time. But there was a maximum of 80 dancers published, um, but you were all expected to learn heading and quarry first and then had to bring and work your way up gently. After five years, you were laid to touch of Sherborne. Um, that's right, you know, you work your way up through the lobby and so on. 
and you were serrated even in the 50s from that monstrous number of women who could do the Morris in class and things like that. Um, I found that, that in fact through the manuscripts there weren't just 80 dancers, there were 350 at least available of a classic Morris. And the other thing you realise once you're putting this down for this, this in fact it was a rolling repertoire for all the old sons. There wasn't a fixed tradition as it were. There was no idea of um, there was a, a as it were a classic Morris that everybody did originally and gradually diverse from it. It's in fact there was a rolling repertoire. Typically um, 20 dancers in practice and perhaps 20 dancers that could be remembered in a pinch and so on and the older dance, surviving dancers can remember even older dancers and so on um, which struck us at the time that seemed to be the way, natural way for a modern Morris to be so that the, not only was spontaneity one of the things to encourage people uh, as they performed and so on, each show to be different. Um, the philosophy was if you do two shows that feel the same to you, give up. You know, every time you do a Morris show, it had to feel special and different from all the others. And the other thing was actually to be restore creativity to the Morris. Um, in a sense, that's been part of my uh, philosophy in, in teaching people. Um, so partly because um, the best thing for Morris side is actually freely owns its own material that it, its dancers are its and not a copy of somebody else's um, which brings me really to the fact that the word revival is one of the things that sticks up I know because in fact it's a reinvention of the Morris there is other than the title of the dances, I think nothing in common between today's Morris and the way it was in the middle of the 19th century. We have no idea how the dances were done then. In fact, I spent many years trying to discover how Mr. Sharp taught the dances, and I couldn't find anybody the way it was. Everybody I talked to either had forgotten how they did the dance at all, or they did it so well they forgot what it was like to be a beginner and how they were being taught. So there's no way of knowing the, the Morris is the way it is today and the way it was. Um, you can't even rely on films and records of that sort because they represent only one snapshot. And the one thing that nobody ever bothered to record was what their ability was tolerated in the side and also the observational fact that when six people dance there's a consensus which is stronger than how they were taught. You know, even the traditional sides depend which six gets up and how far they go and foot up and how far they go and move forth. So there's a certain freedom about the Morris which had got lost, which we tried to encourage. So there we were, um, would I say a philosophy which I've tried to follow since. But what I need to address are the fact the characters. As I said, um, the first lesson from the tradition is that the characters are the elite. The problem is that when you talk about characters, what does the character do? The fool on one side does one fool's around, another side he collects, another side he organises or does the shaping and things like that. So you have to reduce it down to what are the tasks that Morris has to do. Um, and it's very easy to identify four tasks. Actually, it's five tasks really, but the fifth task, which is the ragman come steward come organiser of the background and so on, isn't a character really because it's somebody you don't see. Uh, but there are four tasks. The first one is the MC. Who's in control? Uh, and, you know, we always usually leave it to number one. There's somebody on the side is actually organising the set, choosing the next out, something like that. But one thing you find is that somebody has to think about what you're saying to the audience 
and that means you have to be inter interactive with the audience to some extent. And also, you need somebody watching the audience to see how the show's going. Which means you watch how the audience responds, and that should define what your next dance is. And I know for two years at Fromberg, um, I wore a suit that was actually the MC, and it worked quite well. Um, it's a waste of a dancer, of course, but it is one of the ones that you can use. You know, the audience needs to know what, what, what you are and why you're there. Right. The next thing you need is somebody that the audience can talk to. Now, the lesson was from Bampton, they have a cake bearer who goes around with a collecting tin, as a, an adult as he were, but he drifts through the audience chatting to anybody who wants to chat. Now that means you've got somebody on the side who actually knows what to say about it. Briefly, is he there? Um, because so often you find them on the side when somebody comes up with a question, like the local newspaper reporter, they don't know who to refer him to. There isn't anybody who has that natural job. So that's two jobs. The third job, of course, is what we recognise is the fool. Um, but it's really somebody who um, threatens, is what they would work for. It. Um, they are there to amuse the audience, not to amuse the dancers in particular. I know good clowns will reduce the set to laughter and bring them to a stop if they're doing something particularly clever. But on the whole, their role is to work with the audience, which means they're on the audience side when it comes to dealing with the Morris. Um, therefore, there is a character role of being part of the audience actually does to the Morris what the audience would love to do with them and so on. So there's that interaction in that way. They represent the interaction of the audience to the, the Morris. Um, which brings me to the last role, which is in fact something to look at. One of the great things about Morris is that there's a gap between dances. Often, as long as the dance itself. The typical Morris dance, two and a half to three and a half minutes long. Um, and often two and a half to five minutes between dances if you're not careful. Um, Tony Barron in the States used to set up his video um, and record the total show and then analyse it between what happens when the dance stops and what impression does the body language give to the audience and things of that sort. You know. And you realise in fact there's a big gap to fill and so on. And you were giving the audience something to look at. Something which is beautiful in the um, terms that the bus dancers have. They have the, the beautiful, the people that have this wonderful costume and on. You don't have to do anything really other than be there. King and Queen at Winston, uh, at some of the hobby horses which are large and cumbersome but well done and so on. And some of the animals, they just have to trot around and be admired. You know, and so, on. so we end up with, with four jobs. But the reality is, of course, that you can't say the animal's job is to be beautiful, the animal's job is also to be a fool, to be a collector, uh, to do all the other things. Now, getting a fool to be the collector, um, well, I have this story. Ted Hunt, who was the, um, the fool at Bampton after the First World War, said his job was to take the collecting tin to carriages and the early motor cars. The problem being that as soon as he climbed on the carriage to collect money, they drove off to the edge of the village and then dropped them off so he could walk back. <laughs> <laughs> you think, oh well that's what people were like in those days. But when I was there with Thames Valley in Cranley over in Surrey with Hugh Green, he did the same. They went up to a sports car full of young women and sort of that rattled the ten, they grabbed him in and drove him off to Kent. We didn't see him for the rest of the weekend. Leaving his wife standing there with the Morris wondering what the hell's going to happen. Yeah, so yeah, it does occasionally happen. 
I know it's extreme cases. Um, but there are these problems you have to think about, as it were, and how to balance all these things. The one thing I've noticed in watching sides, watching, sorry, watching the Morris being performed, because the Morris is an event. It's, it's, a, it's happening. You know, it isn't just a bunch of dancers, you see. So what's more with is that when you have characters who switch from one of these four roles to another, the audience are quite often put out by it. You've got used to somebody doing something other than that, or there's something else. You know, and we don't recognise that transitions occurred and the character involved ought to do something like if he's a, a fool to have got out of sight for a bit and then appeared as if he's going to be the, the MC or a collector or something like that with an appropriate speech. You know. In other words, we haven't thought about the presentation well enough. And when I say presentation, I know that keeping the audience involved and interested in what's going on. You know, um, it's like the problem with musicians, you know, when a dancer's over, everything stops, just like it does in practice. You know, um, one of my better hours this last 10 years or so is in fact too many sides, too many sides I mean. <laughs> Form outside like it's a practice night in kit. You know, um, at the end of a dance, let's have a post mortem. Let's have a bit of socialising. Uh, let's let's think what we're going to do next, um, and then it's time to find six people to do it. You know, um, it wastes time. It has a bad body, lang body language effect, and so on. Body language, yeah. Does anybody? side ever actually get somebody bothering them about their body language. Not during the show because everybody, you stand up in the side set, off it goes, they're enthusiastic, they're on balance, they're beautiful, you know, it's great, uh, wonderful, but do they think about what happens in between and so on, you know, do they wonder about getting on and off, do they worry about standing in front of the audience and so on. One of the great things about having to go away with a, a, a chair when watching shows, can't stand up for length of time at all, is the number of times you end up with teens standing in front of you. The idea that a Morris dancer is invisible when you are a kid. You can laugh, yeah, but that's the way they are at practice. You know, no, people don't practice the way they're going to perform outside. You said that. Where does this elite get his experience from? It practices like. What does a clown do? What does a fool do? It practices like. When there's no audience to work with. And so on. Um, it's a bit like musicians. Um, the foreman doesn't want the musicians to play when they're teaching. Uh, so where do the musicians learn to play for Morris? Uh, when I say Morris, cops for Morris, which has all these jumps and things like that. Where gravity dominates the rhythm of movement and so on, so you have to learn a lot of subtlety in playing for things, you see. Um, teams tend to think that somehow or other musicians are going to learn it from, um, I don't know from where, because they never tell them what these to do, why well, not. Again, in the science I mean, don't do it. So we have this sort of fundamental problem. In fact, there is a, an underlying problem in all of us, is that we're amateurs. You know, they're professionals, uh, professionals in any activity whatsoever, have good grounding of their people. Doesn't matter if it's circus people, or bandsmen, or, or what. You know, there are basics things. It doesn't, it's nothing to do with what's your fundamental tradition, you know, what is it you're doing. It, there are fundamental uh, elements of behaviour and so on, which are taught to everybody, which amateurs sometimes don't realise are necessary and don't do it. I no doubt in the past it didn't matter because they were all amateurs. Today we are surrounded by professionals in everything. 
you know, um, and audiences judge us um, against professional behaviour, except for the things that we are unique to the Morris that we bring. And I say, the things that are unique are that we go in to meet them, we're right in front of you, very nice, and so on. And we interact with the audience in a way that nobody else does, and so on. And these are things. So I'm back to say, what do I advise? I don't advise any fool or any animal on how to behave. I expect them to work at eight for themselves. Right? There are the general principles of roles to play and learning to switch from one role to another and so on. But in the end, it's dedication to doing it that matters. And it's not a job for somebody who's not skilled at anything else. You know, uh, just remember that if you are the fool or the animal, you're the elite of the Morris. You know? And to be the elite, that means you're a role model for other people. It means you have to dedicate yourself to doing the job as well as the best you can. And that's really my message for the day. Um, it isn't the way I intended to start out when I was first asked to do this talk, but it's the way it turns out. <laughs> 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 I passed to Clive copies of some of the writings I've done. Um, four pages about the characters and their rules. That's what I've just talked about. Another one, which is a, again, 30 year old doctrine about a clown workshop. If you're intended to be a clown in the circus sense of having some particular skills and things of that sort. Um, yes, I did do a workshop once, um, spent a day um, getting people to work, do exercises and things of that sort. That's written up. But the other thing is the, the peripheral to the, the Morris claim. Uh, the shaman, the um, type of well, let's say it's one of the things about the Morris is the feel good factor it gives people. <coughs> it's inherent, there are two things inherent in human beings. One is the need for leisure. You know, in other words, all people who actually have unremitting, uh, grinding life, you know, that are no good to themselves. Really. <coughs> and the other thing is that when human beings get together, the, the desire to be joyful, I think is the best way of putting it. Unfortunately, um, it, two key times in history which I should mention, one is when the Christians started in, um, converting the Romans. Nearly all the Roman activities, celebratory things, um, were um, tinted with, I suppose, with pagan um, background. It's quite natural when you do something to enjoy yourself, you carry your religious religious, <coughs> religious feelings into it as well. And the early Christians were very worried about the Roman thing and the pagan influence they could see in it. Not recognising that underneath it all was in fact a fundamentally human process. The Puritans who existed at the time with the start of early Morris in this country um, had the same problem. They saw the early Morris and things like that as popish, the sort of thing that throughout the Middle Ages had been celebrated as it so on, and they saw popish and they were opposed to being popish, and therefore they saw the Morris as somehow popish and the church was against it and so on. Fortunately for all of us, the Morris um, has much more life than that. <laughs> it is just a celebration for something you're paid to do. It has an ability to absorb other things. As you know, the Morris has absorbed mama's plays, it's absorbed animals, because the Morris and animals weren't um, things that went together before, and, and so on. You know, it, um, many ceremonies, um, like um, 
the drovers first printer ships coming through Abingdon and so on and Morris picked up all the bits and pieces that become part of their area and so on. It's a great um, thing for absorbing other influences and that you must remember when talking to people about the origins of Morris that in fact most of these other things came before Morris it's the Morris that grabbed them but not the origins of Morris in their own sort of life still um, I've almost lost the point of what I was trying to say then. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. That's more or less what I did up in there. I don't know that. Um, no, thank you. I was just saying, we do have. Uh, no. These documents. Oh, yes. The, there's another one which I've got a copy of a, the text of an American book about jokers and twisters and people of that sort who represent the other side, if you were, of the full, the traditional full men have, and their sort of role. And I was saying about the, the good, uh, uh, feel-good factor of the Morris is explored. The shaman dances for people, make them feel good. The Karanasi in Romania goes to people who are ill and dances there. The Morris goes and dances in the wards at hospitals or goes to old folks' homes at Christmas and so on, exploiting the good people <coughs> and so on. And the Puritans, I must say, didn't put down uh, the Morris because it didn't like Morris. It put down maypoles and football matches together because they brought people together and in the days before police forces that in fact would lead to rioting, um, unacceptable behaviour and um, usually disturbances of a, a sort which they could, didn't want to um, have around that. Having said disturbances, I've been reading recently about Guy Fawkes Day and Hale celebrated in Guildford and Exeter in the 19th century which required in the end troops with fixed payments to come and clear the site. <coughs> no modern site actually, modern Morris sites ever had to be driven off. I remember talking to the assistant chief constable of Hampshire about the Morris and he said there was never any problem with the Morris. Uh, the instruction to the constable is you find a drunken Morris man on the pavement, drag him out of sight and there had never been an accident with them never had a problem of getting Morris down to the head of a pub at uh, closing time. Might have had trouble getting him to go home, <laughs> but on the whole, very well behaved and well thought of. Yeah. You do all the right things. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please and coffees, but don't disappear because I think Pete wants to find out what uh, we, we're going to eat, who's eating, and what we're going to eat at the uh, Weatherspoons. I'll uh, over here. If you would come around to me and say what you want to be lunch, we have.